Hello, everybody. Um, I'm doing a series for a Bible school on hermeneutics and exegesis, and it's introductory level. Um, so I thought that what I would try to do is um, also make this available for everybody that is on Facebook as well. And of course, you know, you hear hermeneutics and exegesis and it sounds like, oh my, you know, these big words. How, you know, sometimes we alienate ourselves from uh, things based upon titles, but literally it's just how to study the Bible. It's um, all about Bible study. And if you're ever going to really come to an understanding of what God has to say, you know, you need to get on a personal level with him in a more radical way and the way to get on a more personal level with the Lord isn't is to go beyond as it were just being spoon-fed in church praise God for church praise God for all the preachers that preach the word <laughs> and that can be a little bit challenging these days but um, uh, you know, everybody is responsible individually this is a personal relationship the Lord has given us the privilege of having and so we should take a, a full advantage of the benefits that we have to have a personal relationship. And, and you know, when you get into the study of hermeneutics, uh, what is from it's derived from a Greek word. I'll spare you uh, as much as I possibly can talking or speaking <laughs> in Greek, um, but. The word, the Greek word simply means interpret. And um, exegesis uh, simply means to, it's once again all derived from another Greek word, and it means to draw out a, the meaning. And so when we talk about hermeneutics, we're talking about really the rules that we must follow, boundaries. We must have boundaries. We must follow rules. And you know, some people want to just make the scripture allegorical. Well, if you do that, it's just anyone's opinion. If, it's, if you spiritualize it, once again, you know, it's just open for anyone's opinion. We have to be sensitive to genre. And you'll see as I lay out the rules for exegesis, or for hermeneutics and exegesis, specifically hermeneutics, um, that... I'm, I'm going to highlight these things over and over again, but one of my rules that I have in that you have to be sensitive to genre. Um, of course, in prophecy, for example, you're going to have a, a symbolization that you have to be sensitive to that symbolization. The symbols are interpreted usually always interpreted it is very rare that you discover a symbol whether it's with in one of the prophets uh, like Zechariah or in one of the books uh, like you would uh, like Revelation that you would not actually have the interpretation of a symbol and and I will try to give you a little bit of that in this introduction um, but poetry you also got to be very sensitive to um, the um, allegorical nature uh, of poetry. Um, we can't go so far as to say that Father has eagle wings, as the psalmist said, that he bear us up like that, or as Moses even said. Um, but at any rate, <laughs> these things should become very, very obvious. The, the wealth of Scripture is narrative. It's instructional. It's instructional. It's instructional narrative that is to be taken literal. And so I'm going to walk you through um, primarily, you know, I have generally about nine rules, specific rules, uh, hermeneutical rules. Um, and I this Facebook is also going to be turned into a YouTube so that we make it available for a long period of time. And hopefully you'll be able to benefit a lot by going back and, and listening again or studying all the things that we're going to be doing. And what I'm going to do for this class is I'm going to take you through um, the hermeneutics and exegesis of a passage of Scripture 
that is going to deal with a lot of very important doctrines. And it's a very challenging verse of scripture that sometimes just gets, you know, it just gets skipped over. It's just too challenging, I think, sometimes. <laughs> we just read it and just kind of move right on past it and don't think too much about it. But that particular passage of scripture that over the next 10 to 12 weeks, as I do this series twice, at least, I'm going to do this at least twice a week um, on Mondays and Tuesdays. Like I said, it is going to be captured in a YouTube, so you'll have it there as well. But we're going to 15 through 16. with um, all of those unique uh, doctrines in uh, Acts 8, 15 through 16, and help you to discover the tools or the usage of the tools. Maybe it is discovering the tools and then the usage or application of those tools to make sure that you have uh, the ability to derive at the right conclusion about this passage of scripture or any passage of scripture. And of course, those of you who went, just went through the study with me on the outline um, uh, of the Old Testament, a survey of the Old Testament, you learned how to appreciate uh, the value of context. And, uh, you know, as I showed how that throughout uh, the whole of the Old have unique situations that arise uh, arise simply from uh, the particular type of king, whether it was in the northern kingdom or in the southern kingdom, who was actually prophesying to the king. The unique, if we back up before that, the unique nature of things that were going on during the time of the judges. Before that, Joshua, um, and before that, you know, looking at uh, you know the Exodus and and the unique situation which Israel found. Um, themselves in in the wilderness and uh, being prepared by God to go into their inheritance and then before that the situation that existed the first 1567 uh, years of creation from Adam to Noah and I, I can't go back over the survey of the Old Testament as I kind of work my way backwards instead of forwards um, and I think those are available in YouTube however for and so I don't know whether or not those would be made public or not so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to do this on Facebook and um, you know I'm all over the world <laughs> and I'm in some places where we don't have good internet speeds and so right now I'm in a place that it's just kind of a mediocre internet net speed and I'm, I'm hoping that this is going to work out all right and you're not going to get a bunch of distorted picture and image from me um, but one way or the other we're going to find a way to get a good quality product uh, up on YouTube so everybody who wants to learn how to do Bible study is going to be able to do so um, with following these simple rules and, and, it's, and it's provable and by and large I'm not going to depart from uh, you know anything that is uh, pretty much peer-reviewed and standard out there what I am going to do is I'm going to emphasize those things which I believe works best for people on an introductory level and I'm always talking about hermeneutics together and I, I well actually you can even find in the literature sometimes where hermeneutics is actually used almost as a synonym for exegesis and um, but I use them always pretty much combined because you're always doing them both together you have the rules in order to apply the rules and as you're applying the rules you're make sure you're making sure that you're not violating anything within the framework of the rules that are defined and that are agreed upon and you're going to see that this is in some kind of special insight we stay away from special insight. If somebody believes they have special insight, we just draw back from that. Because, you know, Peter makes it very clear uh, that no prophecy of the scripture is given for any private interpretation. 
And so we're not going to have private interpretation here. We're simply going to learn how to let the Bible speak for itself. You know, you can go, I mean, hermeneutics, the rules of hermeneutics have been used um, uh, in, in scriptural study, you know, since the very beginning uh, of, of studying out the word of God. I mean, there's the 13 hermeneutical rules of studying the scriptures that are ascribed to by, you know, the Jewish community. <clears throat> and, and there's some of those, especially the last two rules that I have a lot of value in. And I, because I'm always going to be coming back to the rules and applying the rules, which we would call the, the application once again, exegesis, and, and just simply so that hopefully this course and this exercise, you really become sensitized to making sure that you're doing Bible study properly. You're going to refer, you know, I'm going to drive you to refer to a, a, a large um, community of scholars and, and listen to what they have to say. Because it's not necessarily that we're going to agree with what they have to say, because once again, many times, I, 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 you know, it's sad to say, but many times scholars and theologians have more allegiance to their particular denomination than they do really to, you know, proper, honest, and, and forgive me for utilizing that word or objective rather, um, you know, investigation of the scripture. And so it's always having to be, you know, first and foremost, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to find the best words to utilize here without, uh, you know, insulting people, but, really kind of looking at things first from the perspective of it, does my church really agree with this? Is this my, am I being loyal to my denomination? We're going to throw all loyalties aside and our loyalties will be to God alone and to the scripture. And we're going to walk through this thing very humbly. I mean, the Lord is going to minister to us. My, fir my, my first rule of exegesis, for example, is that we rely upon the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher to lead us and to guide us. And I know right there that a lot of people that are in the academic community, they frown on that because then they think that and I can once again turn the tables on much of those arguments in terms of their rules, which as, as a bias for their denomination, and I'm going to say it, Roman Catholic Church versus Presbyterian Church, Pentecostals versus Baptists, Armenians versus Calvinistic. We've got to get, we've got to take off our glasses, lay them aside, take off our, you know, subjective bias, remove it out of the way. And believe me, that is what hermeneutics is supposed to do because hermeneutics, it should always be a part of the rules of hermeneutics should always be bringing us around to say, I should know more about this subject that I, than I did when I first approached it. Um, and what do I mean by that? And it's, it's like, you know, there's, there's various different understandings of the hermeneutic loop, for example, that when you start off, you already start off with a bias. You already have a presupposed idea about what you're getting ready to study. And that bias or that presupposed uh, idea is now going to be challenged by investigation. And so you start off with this idea, and some people call it a theory, but you start off with this idea. And now what you're going to do is you're going to have to uh, uh, now approach the scripture with this idea, uh, albeit a topical study, a word study, um, and, and which is much of how we get at the scripture or the verse itself, because obviously a verse is made up of words. And um, those words, some of those words are extremely important to ultimately deriving the meaning of that verse of scripture, which you're going to understand and appreciate more. Um, it, you know, the way that, the verbs and the adjectives are used. The whole sentence structure is very, very important to us. Then the context in which that verse of scripture 
is is found is very important to, important to us. You know, I'll give you an example. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. You should know the context. You need to know that that prophet Isaiah is prophesying at a, at, at a time in which was uh, a, about 200 years has passed since the temple had been built in Jerusalem by Solomon. Um, it's about probably 120 years or so before um, the uh, the return of the exiled southern kingdom will come back and rebuild the temple. And so if we didn't understand that, we may think that Isaiah is referring, God is referring there to the temple that is built in Jerusalem. He's not. He's not talking about the temple that was built in Jerusalem because that had already been about the temple that was built right around 930, 940, however you want to look at it, B.C., and or we might think, well, you know, it, it's about the temple uh, rebuilt after the Babylonian exile, and it's about neither. Um, and so, if you don't understand or appreciate the context, then in which the prophet Isaiah is saying this, you're going to miss the value of the message. And this study is not going to take away from the personal meaning. It's not going to take away from the ease or uh, of flow of reading the Bible and, and having God speak directly to you. It's going to make it more profound. You know, I'm always encouraging people to read the Bible, continually read the Bible. You need to have Bible study every day. Well, forgive me, Bible reading every day. Start at Genesis 1-1, work your way all the way through. One, and then start again, just systematically read it over and over and over and over again. Then always have with you a tablet sitting right beside of you that when the Holy Spirit lays something on your heart, when you feel really moved by a verse of scripture, you write that verse of scripture down and then you come back to it later because that's going to be your Bible study. And then at that time, you really want to know what is the meaning of this or if, you know, what is God really saying? Let me hear it in the view of all of scripture, okay? And then, you know, it's the same thing. You're sitting in the church listening to me preach or anyone else preach. Listen, you have an obligation to search these things out. Let God be true, every man a liar. Nobody means I don't believe unless they're just a wolf, you know, in sheep's clothing, unless they're, you know, just, you know, like no one means to give, you know, false information. It's usually done on the basis of ignorance or deception. And so you, you know, it's not like we're walking. That's not the ministry of love. We're not walking around suspicious. We're just walking around. Or rather, <laughs> we're listening and, and and taking things in and keeping our heart with all diligence and saying, okay, I'm going to. Investigate to see if these things are true or not. So you've got your little notepad and you're listening to me say something or some other preacher say something, as I said, and you write that verse of scripture down and you ask this question, is this what it really means? The Her laws of hermeneutics is always going to be demanding that we ask questions of the scripture. We're asking questions. Who is this said to? Why was it being said? What was going on at the time? That doesn't take away from its direct meaning to us. It just help us, it helps us to appreciate more, for example, why, why, you know, two people died when they went to church and they died over an offering. It doesn't take, a, like Ananias and Sapphira, right? It doesn't take away the, the, the meaning because all scripture is given to us, to all of us, for reproof, for instruction. You know, it, it, these things are so important that we do take them very, very personal. We just want to understand and appreciate the actual meaning of what's being said. And that's going to demand then that we be students of the word, that we be diligent with the word of God so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. So let me, you know, that's just kind of, a summary. I'm going to repeat myself probably um, and keep adding them. I really, I really try to 
break out of the mold of just teaching things, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and kind of make them sterile and as a transfer of information. Um, what I prefer to do is to try to always bring people in by an application, by an example, and make things more, you know, more, as it were, organic for you, and moving pieces and parts that fit into a conversation, that fit into your everyday life. And so let's try to just walk through some of these rules here um, together. Once again, I am going to post this. I, I know everybody in the class already has these things. Um, and so I will, I will try my best to get them posted, um, on Facebook as well. My hermeneutic rules. Um, and so, uh, let me just start off with this, uh, and, and give you pretty much kind of a, a course description of what's going to go on here. Uh, I'm going to deal with, um, as I said, the laws of interpret interpretation, and in the laws of interpretation, we're always letting scripture interpret scripture. That's really important. That over and over again, and you'll appreciate that more as we go along, and you'll understand the meaning of it more as we go along. Um, there's such a danger of always, uh, you know, imposing preconceived ideas, as I've said. And which, of course, then you obscure then the actual meaning, you know, all these bias, preconceived ideas, you know, all these other things that will. And we're missing the whole value of what's, you know, this wonderful revelation that Father has given to us. He said what he meant and he means what he says. And he means it on the level that he's telling you know, uh, to judge everyone. But he said, I judge no one. He says, the word that I've spoken of you will judge you in that last day. My goodness, that should really grab a hold of us and cause us to have a whole lot of reverence and respect. And remember, that has to be one of the rules, biblical interpretation of hermeneutic rules, is that if you don't tremble at God's word, if, as the Hebrew word says, haradi, or to be a haradim, which you'll find there in that verse of scripture that I referred to in Isaiah chapter 66, verses one through two. Those have got to be rules, general rule, part of the general rules of, of hermeneutics to recognize, look, you have to be a neat or poor or before the Lord, a, a, a place of, of humility before the Lord, recognizing, wait a minute, this is God speaking. You know, I'm not some kind of, you know, redactor here. I'm not some kind of investigator here trying to prove whether or not this is God's word or or, or, or the word of man. I'm not going to be involved in all of these various different techniques of lower criticism. Do, do I think that extant manuscript study is valuable? Sure it is. And of course, I'm talking now to another level. This is going beyond introduction. Do I think redaction criticism is valuable? Sure, but it goes to seed real quick. It goes completely off the rail really quickly. Um, and then when you base your higher criticism or once you've decided what is the word of God versus what is not the word of God, and now you're going to tell me then what the word of God means, listen, that is bogus. That is arrogant. That is the that is absolutely the opposite of vani, or to be poor or humble before the Lord, to be broken or contrite before him, as, the, as God said by his servant Isaiah. You know, that is a place of, of saying a recognition of who we are versus who God is and to triple at his word, the awe of the reality that he watches over his word, that his word is pure, that it is, it's like, you know, his word is like, as the, as the, uh, the psalmist said, or the proverb, uh, the, the, the wisdom the literature said, I'm pretty sure it's wisdom literature said, yeah, it's like silver tried in earthen vessels seven times. It's pure. It's pure. Okay. It's God's word. It's God breathe. And if you don't believe that, then I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to err in the understanding of scripture. And I want you to understand this, everybody that's listening to me. There are so many things taught from the community of scholars and theologians that is coming from that kind of arrogant position. 
And you can't buy in on that. And some people buy in on it ignorantly, but it's still nonetheless a demonic deception. And yes, you heard me right. It is a demonic deception. And I'm not saying that any one group of people have more of that or less of that than the other. I'm telling you the word of God by itself is all that we need. God, the Holy Spirit is here to take his word. His word is living and powerful. It's spirit in its life. And when Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my my blood there is a very literal way to understand that and you don't have to just spiritualize it because although it has that value of the allegory uh, in it as it were there is a literal application and Jesus makes that clear in John chapter 6 and I we will take you through that and help you to understand what's going on here there's been so much misuse and always the ability to discern the misuse is when you start feeling people spiritualizing something, allegorical, even being allegorical about it, trying to say, well, this doesn't mean what it says. It means, God means what it says. Or, oh, there's many translations of the Bible. And, and so there's many interpretations of the Bible. That's nonsense. There is no private interpretation. In other words, Peter is very clearly saying to us in Second Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, there is only one interpretation of Scripture. Somebody said, oh, well, how about all the, the different, um, you know, extant manuscripts out there and all the variants? Look, you know what? In reality, there's not a lot of variants, okay? In reality, when you take all of the, you know, 5,700 plus uh, extant manuscripts of more than 13,000 lectionaries, and I'm, I'm sure there's more than that, and you combine them all together, and you're not going to have more than 93, 94 percent uh, or, uh, you know, you're going to have 93, 94 percent agreement or homology. There's only going to be, you know, somewhere, you know, at the most 7 percent, you know, very vari variation there. And of course, yeah, you throw Tishkin Doris text in there uh, from 1859, February 5th, 1859, and you're going to create some more. OK. And I think that if you could actually then be a little bit more. Uh, objective of recognizing, wait a minute, the Lord has watched over his word and, you know, the, the stream of majority text that is there or that which has been used more than any other has been used more than any other and been copied more than any other because it has been divinely orchestrated. We can't be enlightened <laughs> as it were, as, as you would define it from the enlightenment to somehow write God out of the equation. And this is just something that's going on with man and has been locked in to the realm of just human ability. Wait a minute. Father's watched over his word. This is a divine communication. God Almighty, who is speaking directly to you and me today, as much as he spoke to anyone in the past, he's speaking to us now. And the reason the body of the majority text is there, and it, had, it makes up the majority of all that we find in the extant manuscript community, is because that was divinely orchestrated. And so would you believe that now you've just taken out more variants out of scripture okay <laughs> and i know that some of you know what i'm talking about and i'm probably making some of you mad and maybe i'm making some of you glad i'm telling you this is what i most certainly believe and i believe it in a strong and an ardent community of the Haradim, of the people who tremble at the word of the Lord. And we, and this is unpopular, we, but we believe the word of God is, is accurate and it's true and, and it has been preserved even unto this day. And, and all these contradictions and all of these variants that people find or supposedly find, I'm going to promise you, your contradiction is a evidence that your conclusion was invalid. Let me just slow down and say that one again, once again. Your conversation is simply evidence that your conclusion was invalid. And I'll take that from the uh, from the point of the genealogies given for the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew versus the genealogy given in Luke. I'll take that from the point of anything that was described in one gospel and seems to be described in another. I'm going to promise you that, listen, there is 
Um, I have a book out there. You can refer to it if you want. It's called A Chronological Description um, of, of the Gospels. And um, it's just put forth in a sequential events. I refer to some of the greatest scholars since, you know, um, Tatian. <laughs> and I know some of you don't like Tatian. Maybe you don't think he's that great of a scholar, but, you know, he did. But nonetheless, you know, we're, gonna, we're going to hold fast to the infallibility of the word of God, that the, the divine power of God is right here in the midst of preserving his word. So all this thing, there's a lot of different interpretations. And there's a lot of different, you know, translations. Yeah, there's a lot of different translations. So what? You know, let's look at the majority of what's being said there, the majority of text. I know that the past hundred years, and I will say this, over the past hundred years, the, the translations have been primarily from the Tischendorf text. And I know everybody wants to say, you know, USB 4, but I'm going to tell you, I've done a lot of study of contrast and comparison. Before. And it's just very interesting that when you find a variant in the in the Tischendorf text, you find it in the USB four as well or three. So I'm not going to get into that. I, I'm just making mention of a few of these things because I want people that are listening to me to not just to write me off and say, "Oh, well, that's just ridiculous." This guy hasn't been studying. He needs to go back and into the classroom and study a little bit more to make sure that he understands what he's really saying, yada, yada, yada. Listen, we put our heart into this, okay? So, um, and, and, and we'll do, you know, more advanced uh, studies on this later. But uh, let's go to another part of what this course is going to be all about. You know, it's about definition of words and, and, you know, letting the Bible define the meaning of words. There's a danger in relying on wrong definitions that are imposed upon words. You know, it's been discovered that uh, etymological studies of words or the study, uh, the history of words, the origin of words, how they developed, uh, what is the common root, can lead you down a very dangerous path, a wrong path. Path. So we're gonna we're gonna rather go and take these words, and we're going to find the meaning of these words as they appear in the text themselves. Okay, so we're gonna let the text and the context give to us a, a, a denoted meaning. We're gonna define. We're gonna let it, it's gonna be defined by context rather than purely by a, a dictionary or a lexicon. Now, this is where sometimes students get a little bit afraid because they say, oh, no, 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 I haven't studied Greek yet or I haven't studied Hebrew. Well, you know what makes these things really easy today is that we have great computer programs like Logos or uh, the BLB, which is Blue Line Bible, that you can get as freeware. Or some of you have other, um, you know, Bible programs that you use. And then you can, and it's almost like this interlinear Bibles, right? So you go and you're looking at a word, a word standing out, and it's very, very important to you. You know that the meaning of this verse in, in large part, part hinges um, upon this particular word or the meaning of a, of, of, of a topic or the value of a, a doctrinal idea like reconciliation or justification. They really are strongly hinged to the meanings of words. And many times what we do is just go look it up in a dictionary. And, and, and we've actually created for ourselves a bias there and, and potentially even hit a roadblock of being able to move forward. Whereas if we would just take that word, put it in our search engine, because usually uh, most of these um, Bible programs, you can, you know, kind of point and click and you can get right to the original Hebrew or Greek word. Okay. Then you can put that Hebrew or that Greek word into your search engine. And then what's going to happen is every verse of scripture that has that Hebrew or that Greek word is going to come up in front of you. And now you're going to be able to start doing a study of these words based upon the context. What does the context drive home? You know, when you think about Habakkuk chapter two, verse four, it being as it were the very thesis for Paul's entire work on justification by faith, suddenly you begin to value 
a, a larger meaning of what's being said. Now righteousness is that much more hooked to the obedience and the trust and the walk that Abraham had with God that, you know, that faith becomes that much more uh, attached to this reliance upon God or trusting God. And so, you know, one of the things that we get to use is the Septuagint. We abbreviate it LXX. And the Septuagint is the Hebrew Bible written in Greek during the second century BC when uh, Israel was being Hellenized by tyrants, you know, that were really kings that took, uh, you know, those who rulers who took the place of the conquest of Alexander the Great, like uh, Antiochus Epiphanes the Fourth. Um, but at any rate, at any rate, um, you know, I'm not to go into those studies right now or in, or to backtrack on a survey of the Old Testament. But that Septuagint gives to us a bridge between the Hebrew language and the Greek language so we can start relating words like elsis, the Greek word for hope, to Hebrew words that tra was translated um, into Greek using the word elsis and its various derivatives, derivatives for uh, the way it's pronounced or used or spelled um, for whether it's used as a, you know, as, as you know, uh, an adjective or a noun or a verb. But at any rate, you discover so much about more about hope. You discover that it's expectation. And, you know, it really begins to cause the value and the meaning of that word to blossom before you and the understanding of what God is saying in these verses of Scripture beyond what it has been limited to uh, up until the up until this point, and once again, by your bias, and you say, "Oh, bias," that's being very negative. No, bias is in something that is a negative connotation. It is simply is the state in which we find ourselves. It is the place where we now uh, exist in our knowledge and our understanding. It's what we believe. It's what we're certain of. You know, uh, sometimes I think people say, "Oh, you think you know it all." I don't know it all, but I do have an opinion about a lot of things, okay? That's my bias, and so do you. And, you know, when you've been basically giving yourself to studying, then you've got an opinion about more things, you know? Uh, there's one thing for certain. None of us are perfect in wisdom. None of us are perfect in understanding. None of us are perfect in knowledge. None of us are perfect in conduct. But we should want to be. And God has given to us the privilege. He's given us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. He's given to us the ability to understand and to know what it is he said, you know, and to know what it is he wants and to be able to interact with them and walk with them. And two cannot walk together unless they agree. And so Father's given to us the information that we need, the understanding of his way so that we can agree with them. And so there's not a lot of reason for there being a bunch of different interpretations. Because God is saying the same thing over and over and over again. The majority of what God has said, he said it so many times, it's just redundant. It's just that so much of what people tend to want to do is to say, how does this scripture fit for our lives today? No, it can't be how does this scripture fit for our lives today in the 21st century. It's rather how does our lives fit into the scripture you know, we need our lives need to be conformed to the scripture. In other words, the scripture doesn't need to be conformed to us. You know, we don't need to update the word of God. We don't need to bring God's ancient and antiquated word into the 21st century because it's outdated. God is way out in the future. He's not been on. He's not. What he's saying is about way out in the future, about an eternal place that we have with him and his ways that are unchanging, that will never change. So fundamental to knowing who God is. And the word of God, listen, once again, think about this with me. The word of God is all about knowing who God is, <laughs> understanding the beauty of who he is and understanding what he demands uh, in terms of walking in the laws of life and not violating life. Oh my goodness. So much to say there. Let me try to, uh, to keep the course here. Um, so, you know, one of the other things that we're going to constantly be doing here 
is examining the many different references of scripture uh, versus scripture from reference books and from commentaries. Uh, we're going to listen to what everybody else has to say. And then once again, that's where you're going to benefit from, you know, uh, programs like Logos or BLB or whatever it is. I really like it because I can build a huge library. This is not a commercial for them in any way. Um, but nonetheless, um, uh, you know, and, and hopefully I don't get edited for this. It's amazing how sensitive Facebook could be. But it, nonetheless, um, uh, the, the reality of what I'm trying to say is we want to utilize everybody from, you know, from Calvin to Luther to to um, so many other uh, great um, uh, theologians and scholars that we could talk about that are even uh, folks that are writing today. Um, I tend to have a, a, a great value um, and, and folks that were, you know, devoted uh, to uh, theology uh, 100, 200 years ago, <laughs> but there's still a lot of value today. I love, you know, the theological word study uh, of the of the Old Testament theological dictionaries of the Old Testament um, because so many of them really focus in on words and help us to you know really just flesh out the meaning of words trying to tell us just tell us what the word means and and I'm going to give you a lot of examples of that and so we're going to walk through that together and um, we're going to be careful we're going to be guarded though because once again there's going to be a, deno a usually there's a denominational bias that is being imposed upon those scriptures and like I said if they're coming from a Roman Catholic position and in the Roman Catholic scholar and the Roman Catholic you know uh, paid if you would uh, not to be cynical uh, then they're going to keep with the Roman Catholic traditions and so and the same thing goes for Calvinism and the same thing goes for you know whether it's Roman versus Pro Roman Catholic versus Protestant Calvinist versus, versus Armenian described to and so because they've ascribed to these ideas they read all the verses of scripture in the Bible through that lens and they don't give God a chance to say anything different and one thing that we're, that I am a, a, a totally against is ever arguing over the Bible. The Bible is sacred. It's holy. It's, I mean, argument is a spirit of strife. It's a demonic realm. It's a work of the flesh. It, to in any way take up the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God, the Word of, of life, the, that which is living and powerful and, and, and sharper than any two-edged sword, that which is spirit, that which is life, that which has brought to us this wonderful uh, good news, gospel of life, it's not to be argued over. So now I'm in a kind of, I'm kind of giving you a general sense, just talking to you in my, as I said, kind of organic, you know, uh, way here. And, uh, uh, and now I'm going to try to just list these for you um, and, and just kind of cap, and, and encapsulate them whole, hopefully in, in the general rules. Okay, we must let the teacher who is the Holy Ghost guide us. That's number number one. We, you know, don't. I ask him questions all the time. He doesn't necessarily have to answer me immediately. If I find a verse of scripture that I'm just having, I, I, I've done word studies on it. I've listened to commentaries on it. I, I've gone, you know, and evaluated topically all the other verses of scripture that are similar, or talking about the same subject, and I still don't get it. I still don't understand. I don't wrestle the scripture. I just lay it before the Lord and say, Lord, speak to me, show me, give me wisdom, give me insight. And I leave it. And and it be sometimes it's hours later, sometimes it's days later, sometimes it's weeks, sometimes it's months. I promise you, even sometimes years later, the Holy Spirit will quicken me and it will just come together. I'll be able to see that trying to do some multivariable equation and you just got a blind spot. You know, you've reversed engineered, you know, the equation, you've done everything you can to solve the math problem. And then one day, you know, or sometime at night you're sleeping and boom, it comes to you, you know, the missing piece. Ah, you've got it. Well, the God, the Holy Ghost does, does that for us, but he doesn't do it in the sense, you know, of the way that that math equation was solved just because, you know, we just think about it, you know, we, even when we're not thinking about it, um, 
he comes and he quickens us as we grow, as we mature, as we yield to him. He's amazing. Honor him. Number two, we must recognize that all scripture was spoken by God through holy men who faithfully delivered the word to us. And, you know, and I could say also, and it was also preserved by faithful men. And, and I can show you, um, and maybe we actually can get into proving some of our hermeneutical points to just really show and establish the faithfulness that there was and that existed in the copyists. The people, uh, those who copied the uh, the Old Testament, uh, copying the scrolls of the Torah and the Navim and, and the whole of the uh, of the uh, Old Testament Bible, part of the Bible, and then also the faithfulness and you know the carefulness that was used in copying the New Testament, and then look at the variety of copies that were cre created um throughout the the world and the different communities whether it's a greek orthodox church or whether it was you know the walden seas or some you know smaller community or whether it was the united states or whether it was in england or whether it was in the fourth century or whether it was in the uh, 19th century look at look at the homology look at the agreement there look at the faithfulness that was that is just observed uh by by the agreement that we see in all of those extant manuscripts and so uh, we go we're going to go with this you know in this general rules therefore that the scripture is absolutely correct and has been carefully preserved by God and no one should have a problem with that and if you do have a problem with that just you know first of all stand up and say so you problem with that and before you speak make sure that we all know that you're one of these people that do not believe that the scripture is absolutely correct and that has been carefully preserved by God and then we can understand where you're coming from but to hide that and then to try to present to us that this is what the Word of God says all within that bias, well, then that's just simply unethical, okay? Hopefully everyone can appreciate that, okay? Number three then, and, and I'm going to try to wrap this up now, is adding to the word. Uh, do not add to the word. Do not take away. It cannot be allowed. Oh, and severe p penalties come along with that. I'm going to be quick now, and we'll go over this more later. Number four, we must let Scripture interpret Scripture. Number five, there must be at least two or three witnesses to establish any truth in the scripture, two or three verses of scripture, to establish any doctrine. And then number six, you cannot violate the context of the scripture to establish a doctrine or a truth. Number seven, the conclusion one derives must not contradict other scripture. It invalidates the conclusion. Number eight, doctrine must be derived from what the scripture definitely teaches not what is inferred. And boy, could I ever talk a lot about that one, okay? We'll talk about that more. Number nine, we must be sensitive to the genre and understand the allegorical nature of poetry and symbolic nature of prophecy and the literal nature of the narrative and also recognize the symbols. We always have an interpreted meaning so it becomes a part of the, of the genre of narrative and can be understood literally. God bless all of you. We love everyone. Study the word. Read the word and study the word because the word of God it was working a miracle. You may not even understand it. What's what's happening? It may seem all natural, but the word of God is powerful. It's miraculous. It's supernatural. And just while you're reading, um, miracles are taking place in your life. God is expanding your heart and developing you to receive more, to understand more, uh, to to be empowered. His word works mightily in those who believe. Oh, his word works effectually with divine power and those that receive it. Bless you. See you next week with more on hermeneutics and exegesis and introduction. And then, of course, starting next week, we'll be doing it twice a week.